grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 1,390. That's the number of people that are listed as members at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. 1,390 people, 1,390 names, 1,390 stories, 1,390 heads that have been doused in baptismal waters, 1,390 pairs of ears that have at one time or another heard the gospel Easter proclamation, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now, we didn't quite have all 1,390 of us in worship here last week, but by golly, the Lord was present as he brought 1,023 of us together, gathered in worship and praise of him. And what an, an awesome thing. Thanks be to God. That many people hearing the gospel, that many people lifting up their voices in songs of praise and shouting, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Last year, I think I shared with you the week after Easter some of the things that I heard from people at the Easter service or afterward. They said, wouldn't it be great if we had this many people in worship every week? And I thought, well, yeah, that, that would be great. And this year, the same thing happened as people were exiting the sanctuary after it had been filled with twice as many voices as usual. Again, they said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had this many people in worship every week? And I thought, yeah, it would be great. And I might have shared with you last year as well my question that was in the back of my head whenever they told me that. Well, what are you going to do about it? It would be great if we had that many people in worship every single week, but what are we going to do about it? It's not enough to just pay lip service to the fact that it would be great to have over a thousand people in worship every week, but what are we going to do with it? It's time to act. It's time to act because we know what's on the line. Eternity with Christ, that's what's on the line. It's not just something to boast about how many people attend, nor how big our congregation is, or how big our budget is once you see the impact report. It's not enough to just talk about that stuff. It's not about any of that. It's about life with Christ now and forever. It's about connecting with one another in love and in faith and in service. It's about reaching others with the message of the resurrection. It would be great to have over a thousand people in worship weekly. I don't know where they'd go, but it would be great to have that. So what are we going to do about it? It's time to act because the message of the resurrection is life-changing. The resurrection itself is life-changing. That's precisely what the followers of Jesus experienced on that first Easter Sunday. The disciples hid in fear, wondering who stole their teacher's body, wondering why Mary keeps going on about this encounter with a gardener, wondering what the future would hold for them. And then it happened. The resurrected Jesus appeared. That same thing happened a week later when Thomas, who was absent the first week, was now present with them. And both times, the disciples' instinct told them they should panic, but their Savior told them to be at peace. In an instant, they went from being cowardly to courageous, from terrified to tenacious, from spineless to spirited, from fearful to fearless. And Thomas went from disbelief to a firm faith, all because the resurrection is life-changing. Soon the apostles would finally leave the upper room as the Holy Spirit made them to be fearless in the face of opposition. And boy, did they face opposition. I preached last week and told you a few of the terrifying ways that these guys faced opposition. They would not have been so bold on their own with this fearless faith in the risen Savior. They would not have been so bold on their own, but the Holy Spirit's power was working through the message of the resurrection, and they were fearless. And for that reason, because they were fearless, we see in our Acts 5 reading that more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. More than ever. That is a huge statement when you consider that two chapters before this, 3,000 people were baptized in one day. And then a chapter before this, 5,000 people. And daily, they were adding to that number. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord? Yikes. Because of their fearless proclamation, innumerable lives were changed forever. Changed in this life, yes, but especially and most importantly in eternity with Christ because their debt is paid, their sins are forgiven, and because the resurrection changes lives. The life of the Sadducees and the Jewish leadership was changing as well. They were rapidly losing control of the people in some ways. They were no longer held in as high esteem as once before. These men of stature who were once feared by all people were now afraid of the power and prestige of the apostles. They couldn't handle this change. 
So in a fit of jealousy, it says, they lashed out, throwing the apostles in prison. But when God is calling his people to proclaim, there's no stifling his message just by throwing people in jail. When God seeks to break prisoners free from the chains of sin and death, there are no prison bars he cannot pry open. When God is ready for his church to take action, there's no stopping him. And so faced with the threat of returning to jail, the apostles boldly, confidently, fearlessly proclaimed this life because the resurrection changes lives. And thanks be to God, we too have received this life-changing message. You have experienced this life-changing message for yourselves. You know, you know what God has done in and through you and because of this message. But real quick, great show of hands, how many of you have ever been to a non-Christian funeral or to a funeral of someone that it was questionable whether they were Christian or not? It was kind of a sad event, wasn't it? And depressing because there's no hope or uncertainty at best. Show of hands, how many of you know someone in your life who is still alive right now who does not know Christ, who is not a Christian, or you're not sure if they're a Christian or not? Which means that if something happened today, they would have that sad, depressing, hopeless, uncertain kind of funeral. And yet we have received this life-changing message. We have received this life-changing message that Christ is risen. What are we going to do about it? If we really believe in the resurrection, and the resurrection is life-changing, what does that mean for how we live as individuals? What does it mean for our congregation? What does it mean for our interactions with those who do not know the forgiving, resurrected Jesus? I think it means that it's time to take action. And though that might seem scary, because it means change in some ways, it means stepping out, though it might seem scary, we have no reason to fear, no reason to be afraid of reaching out in faith, no reason to be afraid of what the future holds for us. We have absolutely no reason to fear. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they were afraid. They were afraid to admit that they were wrong. The, the av evidence was stacked against them concerning the resurrection of Jesus, but in spite of that, they threw the apostles in prison only because they were jealous. They wanted to hold on to the idea that there was no resurrection. That was their chief doctrine, that there was no life after death, that everything was hopeless and there was nothing afterwards. That's depressing. That's why they were often the apostolic antagonists in the book of Acts, because the message of the resurrection was a threat to them. So in the face of this life-changing, even life-giving message, the Sadducees clung to death. They would not give up their ways, even if their ways were lifeless and depressing. And there were others in that Acts 5 reading who were afraid. Verse 13 points out that some of the people never dared join them. You get the sense that they never dared join them, that it's almost as if they believed what the apostles were saying. It says that they held them in high esteem, so it's almost like they wanted to, but for some reason they didn't probably for fear of the Sanhedrin and the temple guards. They, they didn't want to join them, and they didn't want to get thrown into prison like the apostles. For them, it was far more comfortable to not change than to be daring. Folks, Christ is risen. And for that reason, we have nothing to fear. And yet, I wonder, are we ever like the Sadducees, clinging to lifeless programming in our church? I know I'm maybe meddling a little bit. But what are the sacred cows in this congregation that we hold on to that if we were really honest with ourselves, they're not quite as effective as they could be, but hey, it keeps me busy. Are we more focused on maintaining the status quo than actually being effective in our mission and ministry? Are we ever afraid to be daring in how we act as a church? Are we afraid to how we carry out some of our ministries because of personal pride? We don't want to step on toes. Afraid to minister to people of a generally lower income because we don't see the monetary return in the offering plate. Afraid to be daring because it might actually work. We have no reason to be afraid because the Spirit enables us to act with a fearless faith. And as we saw with the apostles, a fearless faith leads to fearless proclamation, and a fearless proclamation leads to kingdom multiplication, and that's what it's all about. That is what we're called to do, is fearless multiplication through fearless proclamation. 
30 years ago, a handful of people were daring. They were not, uh, they would not settle for the status quo. The only thing that they feared was being stuck in a rut. The life-changing message of the resurrection had consumed them. The spirit was relentless in stirring up a daring faith, a faith that led them to a vacant lot. And all around this vacant lot, they saw nothing, nothing but the potential for what God could do in and through them. But before they could do anything with that property, they gathered for worship. They gathered around God's Word in the Broadway Inn Motel, not so classy. And by the grace of God, through faith in Christ alone, led by the Spirit's ongoing activity and guidance through the Scripture, today, we, all 1,390 of us, we reap the benefits of their daring faith and their fearless proclamation because the Spirit dared them to take action, because the resurrection is life-changing, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ's mission for His church, and therefore His mission for us today. It was the mission for those 25 or 26 people 30 years ago, it's our mission today too. go and make disciples of all nations. The thing is, it turns out he actually meant it. Go and make disciples. What's a disciple? It's someone who is a follower of a teacher or a leader. For the church then, it means that we're trying to make followers of Jesus. We believe at Holy Trinity that a, a disciple is someone who is uh, striving to live Christ's mission through service outreach, fellowship, education, and worship. That's what we're about, each of us, disciples, engaged in some way, shape, or form in living out Christ's mission through service, outreach, fellowship, education, and worship. We are disciples who make disciples who make disciples. In fact, our vision is to work toward making 500 disciples of Jesus by next year. 500 followers of Christ, just in time for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 500. Now, that's a big number. That's more than just the one or two baptisms a month. 500. Think about that. That's a big number. But we have a big, big, big God. A God who changes lives in a big, big way. We have a God who has looked past our big, big sins and failures. A Savior who has purchased and won us with His own blood and now calls us in a big, big way to speak this new life to all the world. And when God is calling His people to proclaim, there's no stifling His life-changing message. 500 by next year, we can do that. 500 by next year with God, all things are possible. With a message like the resurrection, that's a cinch. Now, don't get me wrong. Our aim is not a bigger congregation, but to make disciples. If congregational growth happens, awesome. That's amazing and it's going to be crazy. Thanks be to God. Our aim is not a bigger congregation, but to make disciples, for people to know Christ. Our aim is that people join in living Christ's mission through service, outreach, fellowship, education, and worship. Folks, 28%, which is over 200,000 people, 28% of Oklahoma County are unchurched or dechurched. Over 200,000 people in our county do not know Christ. Over 200,000 people are in dire need of hearing the life-changing message of the resurrection. What are we going to do about it? It's time to be daring. It's time for fearful proclamation of the gospel. It's time to take action. Before I received the call as assistant pastor here, I was having a conversation with Pastor Hinky, and he asked me if I had a, a vision, an idea for what I saw Holy Trinity's future being. And I told him that I see that we have the potential of being an evangelism monster. I know that's weird phrasing, but let me just explain that. Uh, think of it. 1,390 pairs of eyes looking around this community upon the scenes so desperately in need of a life-changing message. 2,780 legs covering about every corner of this city. 2,780 ears listening to the hurts, the needs, the cries of the oppressed all around us. 2,780 arms embracing the community in love, reaching out to those in need. 1,390 mouths proclaiming a message of love, of grace, of hope, of forgiveness, of Christ is risen. He is risen That's an evangelism monster, of something that is unstoppable by any force of this world if only we dare to act in faith. The Spirit empowers and emboldens us to dare to take action. The Spirit was active and at work through the disciples as more than ever believers were added to the Lord. The Spirit has been active and at work through the history of the Christian church on earth ever since. And the Spirit has been active and at work through you 
ever since your baptism, working in you the forgiveness of sins and calling you to a new life, preparing you for this moment to dare to act, calling you and me to live in mission in this world, to join in fearless proclamation. I dare you to take action this week. There's a space in your bulletin outline uh, to, to mark and identify someone that you can invite to church this week. Think about who that person is right now. It might be the person that you thought of when you raised your hand a few moments ago. Pray for an opportunity to invite them. And then take action. Actually do it. The worst they can say is no. And if they say no, ask them why. It might open the door for more conversation and an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And, and if they say no, ask them if you can pray for them. Just imagine if 1,390 people were invited next week. Of course, we don't have probably 1,390 people in worship this week, so let's just break it down to the 500. What if 500 people were invited to church next week? And what if they actually came? Your invitation could change their life forever. As we seek to take action to connect 500, let's also pray to be daring. Let me tell you something that I'm praying about as I'm praying to be daring and, and all of this lately. I've, I've just been thinking about this quite a bit. So when you look at the history of LCMS congregations in the Oklahoma City area, it's really interesting to me. The very first congregation that was planted in the Oklahoma City area is Zion Lutheran Church in 1906. And ever since then, about every 30 years or so, give or take, every 30 years, there have been new people who dared to take action. About every 30 years, a new church was formed or planted. Every 30 years or so, a group of believers whose lives had been changed by the gospel, by the grace of God, people with faith in Christ, people whose lives were focused on and led by the scriptures, every 30 years, a group like that dared to take action and plant a new church. And so you know what's been on my mind lately as I've been praying as Holy Trinity is entering our 30th year? Is this the time for us? I've been praying for the Holy Spirit's discernment and guidance to know if the time is now. And if it is time, I've been praying for boldness. I've been praying for fearless proclamation for the sake of kingdom multiplication. And the only thing that scares me isn't that we might fail, but that by the grace of God, we might actually succeed. And I don't know what we're going to do about that. But whatever God is calling us to right now, whatever the next big thing is for Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, may we be fearless. May all the redeemed, all across this world who have been bought with the blood of Jesus, dare to take action as we live out the mission of Christ, who dared to die for us, dared to rise for us, dared to call us into a new life, and dares to join us in mission. And may we ever be so bold in our witness to proclaim Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen.